organizers for uh, the opportunity to, to talk today. I want to shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about some of the work that we're doing uh, with some electronic uh, health records uh, in the U.S. Um, so today I'm going to cover uh, sort of three aspects. I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, electronic health record data, uh, some applications of that data, and then uh, finish up uh, with some conclusions. So I'm not sure how familiar people are with this. Adoption model, but uh, EHR uh, EHR adoption sort of progresses through sort of seven different stages. So starting at the bottom, uh, essentially no use of electronic health records, and moving up to uh, the addition of uh, ancillary uh, services being added, labs, radiology, pharm pharmacy, and then the addition of uh, other services such as PACs, uh, some clinical decision support systems, uh, physician order entry, and then. Uh, all the way up to the top in stage seven, uh, sort of full continuity of, of the data between uh, emergency department, ambulatory, and, and outpatient uh, settings. So if we, if we look in the U.S., uh, EHR adoption's been, uh, it's occurred uh, quite quickly over the, over the last few years, uh, primarily due to uh, government incentives and mandates that have uh, been put in place. Uh, so on the left, you can see in 2008, very, very little uh, adoption of, of electronic health records uh, versus uh, you know, most recently, or more recently in uh, 2013, it's, uh, it's quite widely, been quite widely adopted. Um, this, this just illustrates the level of uh, stage uh, that, that, we've <coughs> that we're observing across the U.S. So uh, in 2012 and 2013, the majority of uh, hospitals were sort of in that stage three. Uh, but now you can see that more of them have progressed to stage five and verse six. So, you know, what, what's the data then that we're, we're talking about? The, the data that, that we use uh, comes from CERNER. There, there's probably a dozen electronic healthcare providers uh, in the United States, and CERNER is the third largest one. Uh, they're, they're in about a thousand hospitals, uh, and that data is comprised of, of quite a bit of information here. So we have, we have things related to the facility type, so we know if it's an academic institution, if it's a, a teaching or not teaching, the, the relative size of that hospital, where it's located geographically, is there's oftentimes significant uh, variation in care uh, depending on the geographic location. Uh, we've got a lot of in information about admission and discharge status, uh, patient demographics, so everything from you know, patient age and weight and gender. Uh, we've got full clinical assessments, uh, diagnoses, and procedure codes, uh, essentially all of the ICD-9 uh, procedure codes. Uh, the, the real value of this data comes in uh, with the labs and the medications, so everything in here is time and date stamped. Uh, we have all of the information related to medications that are, that are administered to patients and all of the labs, including microbiology uh, tests that are ordered, and all of the results, so all of the clinical labs, everything from basic clinical chemistry labs, uh, as well as microbiology test results. All that information is contained within, within this data set and, and allows us to address or ask and answer a number of uh, clinical related questions. In addition, we've got a lot of billing information as well. So as uh, healthcare, uh, even in the US, uh, becomes uh, you know, much more of a focus on cost effectiveness, we can now uh, use some of this data to address some of the cost effective uh, uh, care uh, that's being delivered. So just a brief overview of the data that we're looking at. It is pretty extensive. It goes back uh, as early as January of 2000 uh, up to uh, uh, the most recent data that we have uh, goes all the way through 2014. So we're looking at roughly 43 million unique patients, uh, 200, almost 240 million unique uh, encounters. It's a mixture of inpatient and outpatient encounters. Uh, we've got, as I said, all of that, all of the diagnosis information, clinical events, so things like blood pressure, temperature, uh, heart rate, uh, a number of uh, different clinical events are, are contained in there, uh, 2.6 billion lab results, a tremendous amount of microbiology uh, data as well. So some, some of the things that we're doing with this data today, um, we're right now looking at uh, trying to answer some questions related to readmissions, what's driving uh, different readmissions from either a medical or a surgical patient population. We've looked at uh, pain management, looking at you know, optimal uh, uses of uh, pain medications in a post-operative setting, uh, in burn patients, pediatric patients, 
looking at this transition uh, process from acute to chronic uh, post-surgical pain. Uh, we're doing a lot uh, with infectious disease as well, looking at overall just epidemiology of different uh, infectious organisms, <coughs> looking at different treatment options, such as uh, specific options for fluid management, looking at high versus low chloride uh, decision making, uh, looking at antimicrobial stewardship. And then in the perioperative care setting, where uh, we've most recently looked at uh, within a cardiac surgery population, trying to address several questions related to uh, fluid selection. So whether that fluid resuscitation is done with a colloid or a crystalloid, uh, whether it's uh, high versus low chloride uh, crystalloid, uh, synthetic versus natural, uh, natural colloid, and we can use this data set to answer all of these questions. We, we, don't, we don't believe that the data set is a substitution for uh, prospective randomized controlled trials, but it gives us an opportunity to churn through a lot of data on a lot of patients uh, quite quickly uh, and help to better uh, define what a prospective study might look like. So I want to spend a little bit of time just walking through one of these recent uh, studies that we're, that we're doing, uh, looking at uh, trying to address the question of colloid or crystalloid following uh, on-pump cardiac surgery. So IV, uh, IV volume resuscitation is used to increase uh, intravascular volume uh, and augment and maintain cardiac output in organ perfusion. I think virtually all uh, cardiac surgery uh, patients receive some amount of uh, uh, volume uh, post-surgically. Uh, and the systemic inflammatory response due to uh, on-pump or uh, bypass itself uh, can induce capillary leak, uh, leading to that, that need for fluid resuscitation. So the preferred uh, fluid uh, for that resuscitation uh, is widely debated, uh, whether, whether it should be crystalloid or, or colloid, um, and that, that was one of the questions we sought to, to try and address. So we, <clears throat> we had two questions. Uh, first was uh, to compare the outcomes of patients undergoing uh, on-pump cardiac procedure and requiring fluid resuscitation. And they were resuscitated with either a 5% albumin plus crystalloid or crystalloid alone. Um, and then second, uh, to assess the hospital level uh, cost impact uh, on the choice of those fluids. Uh, there's a significant cost difference between uh, normal saline versus 5% albumin. And, and we wanted to, to try and address what the, the cost benefit trade-off was. So ju just a brief overview of the, the study design. Uh, we, we went through uh, uh, patient uh, inclusion and exclusion uh, using the data set. We also uh, identified all of the uh, underlying comorbidities in patients, then assigned them to the different cohorts, uh, did what's uh, referred to as a propensity scoring and matching, um, and then lastly uh, compared uh, the various outcomes, uh, clinical and, and outcomes on the basis of either clinical information or administrative coding. So ju just a uh, brief overview of how the, uh, the cohorts were assigned. Uh, we, we looked at uh, the choice or the fluids that were assigned to patients uh, post-surgically. Uh, so we followed them over the, the entire course of their, their stay. They had to receive you know, qualifying fluids, uh, you know, either that are, I guess, displayed here. So the albumin cohort had to, had to have received 5% uh, albumin. Uh, we didn't include any patients that received 25% small population as well as PPF. Uh, and then the crystalloid cohort had to receive any amount of uh, <coughs> crystalloids, but they did not uh, receive any, any albumin. So the crystalloids that they received <coughs> excuse me, had to be at least, uh, at least 500 mils of either normal saline, uh, balanced solution, uh, lactated ringers, or, or ringers uh, solution. To, to match these cohorts appropriately and, and try and minimize the amount of bias that's, that's inherent in any sort of uh, observational study. Uh, we, we use a process of, uh, it, it's referred to as the, the Elixhauser algorithm, uh, to define all of the underlying uh, comorbidities. So Elixhauser, Elixhauser comorbidities uh, are defined here as, as those that exist before the patient's admission to the hospital. They're not related to the principal reason for hospitalization and they're likely to be a significant influencing, to be significant factor influencing mortality or resource use. Right, so, so we've worked out that these algorithms are, are uh, widely published uh, for how, how to define these in, a, in an observational data set. And we've, we've adapted them uh, to the data set that we're using to, to calculate the comorbidities for all of the patients. The 
propensity scoring and, and matching uh, process then is, is sort of illustrated here. So what, what we have on the left is a, an abundance of patients, uh, in this case, you know, roughly 1,200 patients who received uh, crystalloid only following their cardiac surgery, and roughly 5,000 who received a mix of albumin and crystalloid. Um, they're, they're a mix of patients on the basis of demographics, comorbidities, uh, and other hospital characteristics. And the propensity scoring model essentially identifies patients that have similar characteristics from, you know, from a uh, comorbidity standpoint, from a uh, geographic standpoint, uh, basic uh, patient demographics. And, and at the end, uh, <coughs> results in a uh, matched cohort, in this case, uh, roughly 1,100 patients in, in both, both cohorts uh, receiving either crystalloid alone or 5% albumin. So that's just uh, shown here in, in more detail. So we started with roughly 28 million patients uh, and narrowed that down to uh, the 1,200 uh, saline patients that I, that I mentioned, and 5,000 albumin, uh, and then the one-to-one the -one, uh, matching process afterward, leaving us with roughly 1,100 patients in, in each of the cohorts. If, again, because of all the uh, information that's collected within the data set, there's a, there's a large number of, uh, of uh, uh, outcomes that we can evaluate, so we can look at we can look at all the fluid volumes uh, that patients receive over time, and we can control for uh, the amount of fluid that they receive. We can look at all of the ICD-9 codes, diagnosis and procedure codes. Um, we essentially looked at uh, we looked at the impact of that fluid decision on renal failure, hemorrhage, uh, coagulopathy, uh, various uh, uh, organ function. Um, so. We're in, we're in the process of publishing this. This is uh, just sort of the key takeaway here. What, what we found uh, within these two groups was a uh, significant reduction in mortality at, at all of the time points that we, that we looked at. So uh, index mortality as well as 30, 60, and 90 day uh, mortality. Uh, so for patients who received albumin uh, along with uh, crystalloid, there was a, a substantial reduction in that mortality. And that mortality, that mortality reduction seems to be driven by a reduction uh, uh, less impairment of uh, 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 pulmonary uh, dysfunction, uh, which, which may be attributable to uh, the albumin patients receiving slightly less uh, resuscitation uh, fluid uh, than, than the crystalloid patients, and also a, a slight reduction in, uh, in renal uh, function as well, or renal dysfunction. So fine, I guess the last, last thing I'll finish on is uh, we, we then take that information and look at what the uh, overall financial impact is. And so while there's an increase in the uh, IV fluid cost, uh, there was a significant decrease in the overall length of stay, uh, procedure, diag diagnostics uh, that are performed, uh, leading to an overall uh, net decrease in the total uh, annual cost of care. Um, <coughs> I'll, uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, just uh, stop there. Can you please tell us uh, something more about yourself, where are you located, and uh, what uh, you're representing? Yeah, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a partner with a, uh, a healthcare consulting firm. Uh, this is uh, the majority of the people within our firm. The uh, company is based in Boston. Uh, we work with a large number of pharmaceutical, medical device, and diagnostic companies. A lot of the work that I was talking about here today, we uh, partner very closely with uh, a lot of uh, clinical and academic uh, partners, so this was done with uh, some colleagues at Vanderbilt and Duke uh, in order to, to facilitate the analysis. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Please, Doctor. Thank you for your presentation. Do you have any plan to have the preoperative guidelines regarding the patient safety and the patient's benefits <laughs> to correct all the things, pitfalls, that is not for patient safety and patient's benefits. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we, don't, we don't develop any of those guidelines, uh, but we do work with a lot of uh, academic institutions uh, who are influential in, in creating some of those guidelines. We, we haven't looked at preoperative uh, care yet, uh, but, I mean, as you can, as you can imagine, there, there's a lot of uses for this data. Easily uh, look at, at uh, a number of choices related to uh, preoperative uh, decision making as well. Thank 
Okay. Uh, I've got uh, several um, okay. questions out of curiosity. Each are uh, quite unique. Um, I suppose is it a uh, US wide system of electronic health records? Uh, yes. The opportunity for every doctor to access it and uh, look at, uh, including private doctors from private practices and uh, hospital doctors. Is it right? Uh, so, it, so it's a mix. So it's a the data that we're working with is only in the US, uh, but Cerner uh, is a global company and I think uh, has uh, is the electronic health record uh, that's used uh, in, in a number of hospitals around the world. Uh, the, but the data that we're working with is restricted to the US. Okay. Uh, but they, they charge for access to that data. Uh, okay. And they charge a pretty hefty sum uh, for access to that data. And the other, the other limitation is that due to the cost of Itself. So, large academic institutions in the U.S. It cost, I've heard figures upwards of five hundred million to a billion dollars to, to implement you know, a system-wide electronic health record system. So, you can imagine that that's only at the largest clinical institutions. And Can't it's have slowly working to that. its way down to, okay. to the smaller mm -hmm. And Does the HR um, uh, um, have uh, the data from all um, labs, including private labs? just a certain amount of uh, laboratories? Yeah, so it, it really depends on the health system itself. Uh, so yeah, on, on how integrated they are and where they're pulling their data from. So uh, many institutions have a central lab uh, where, where that data is all, all going. If they're sending it out to a private lab, something like the lab for Quest, there's a big uh, lab providers uh, in the US, that information may not be captured. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do you, uh, how does EHR comply or implement, implement uh, privacy, security. Yeah, so Cerner is responsible for all of that. Uh, so again, they're in about a thousand hospitals around the US and roughly five or 600 of those uh, share data. So Cerner pulls that data on a nightly basis and runs it through the identification process. So, uh, so what they end up doing is we have basic patient demographic so, so we have their age, but not their absolute birth date. Right? We, we have dates of care, but those dates of, of care, that window of time is, is set, but then it's shifted around at random uh, so that different conditions, you know, if it's a relatively rare condition, you wouldn't be able to sort of dig through this data and find that specific patient because that, that shifted. There's a lot of other information that's, uh, that's blinded and, and contained in the data. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> In regards to research, does anyone have any questions? Uh, uh, 5% of albumin, uh, is it what, you, uh, what cardiac surgeons use in the uh, in US? Uh, uh, that, that's my understanding. So, so full, full disclosure, I'm not a clinician, uh, but, but the, uh, the anesthesiologists and cardiac surgeons that, that we are working with on this, yeah, 5% albumin is the, uh, is the colloid that, that would be used. Uh, yes, uh, we've been using I remember 10 or 20 percent. Okay. So, um, yeah, Dr. Indra Ratna maybe <laughs> uh, may ask or uh, may answer this question. So, so I think the SAFE study looked at, it, it looked at it in a number of different patients, correct? Yeah, in a critical care setting. Uh, so, so we've also looked at the uh, you know, choice of different crystalloids, uh, specifically crystalloids in a uh, critically ill population and some variation based on high versus low chloride uh, uses. Um, you know, I think the data, uh, it, it wasn't clear in the SAFE study specifically around the cardiac surgery population uh, as to as the impact of, of yeah. using that. Absolutely, critically ill population. I think I'll be able to Thank you very much. Uh, it, it was very uh, useful to find out about uh, EHR. Uh, we in Australia use uh, different databases uh, in different uh, states. Like in Queensland, we've got a similar system called UR, uh, where you can access the patient's uh, demographics and admissions episodes, uh, including some uh, lab. Data, but not uh, Australia-wide. Uh, 
some reason. So there are different apps and uh, different uh, uh, yeah. databases. But anyway, it was very uh, interesting to know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you.